Good afternoon, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the AI webinar The Future Soldiers Path Between Operations and Technologies. My name is uh, Alessandro Marrone, Head of Defense Program at AI, and uh, I will moderate uh, the whole uh, event. The webinar will discuss uh, uh, the study published by AI entitled The Next Generation Soldier, a System of System Approach, which has been just published a couple of weeks ago on the AI website. And I'm very glad to give immediately the floor for a keynote speech to the chairman of the European Union Military Committee, General Claudio Graziano. General, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Marone. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to attend this discussion. And of course, I thank AI. Uh, for organizing this meeting and uh, all, and I salute all the panelists. Uh, as I said sometime, I, in this moment, I have the highest military authority in the European Union institution. That means that I'm, uh, the most senior, so the oldest. So it's, uh, uh, I have already seen all many transformation in the warfare, but I have to say that I read also with interest the paper by edited by you and Carolina Muti, and others regarding the next generation of soldiers. That is something very, very, uh, very relevant. Of course, I'm not going to go inside this outstanding paper because later we're going to be uh, the discussion. Uh, but I just will express some uh, opinions in some points. Some of these are referred to the very well explained uh, hot playground for research, industry, and armed forces. Some other belong more to the military mindset or the end user perspective, that is my task. And some other more belong to politics and public opinion. Now, starting with the technological race, you'll know that the armed race characterized the Cold War. And uh, I have the feeling that we are living a new race, even more dangerous or even more challenging, a technological race, or better, what I call the artificial intelligence armed race that will lead us in the future. But today, we are not able yet to imagine the world to come because artificial intelligence, if you want, just started. And the, the important thing is going to be the implementation of the artificial intelligence in all the system. So we have to think about evolving system because we are living in age in between, a bridge between new and old paradigms. And if you think all the main system already under project, in the, even under development, but probably what is now the system is not going to be the same in 15 years. And this one is also valid for <coughs> the next generation soldiers. What is important, this one is time to study, to understand, to adapt, to fit the gap. If we miss this pace of this race, we're losing the momentum and probably are going to be crushed. But the great power, if you want, or the uh, technology competitors, let's think to China and United States. So whatever we speak about is a race for technology superiority. And you know that technology, uh, the technological advantage uh, can be achieved only through innovation. And literally, when we use the term next nowadays, we are already talking about innovation. Maybe this one is a good word, but something that is shaping our lives and never be, as never before. Now, innovation is uh, an important uh, word, I would say. And I want to share and comment with you uh, an episode that took place a couple of days ago. We were discuss discussing innovation uh, within uh, uh, the EDA, within the European Defense Agency. And uh, while I was in a meeting with some great officer of my international staff, I asked them the definition of innovation, and they tried to give me some answer immediately. But I gave them some time to think about it. Then they come back with an impressive and very articulate answer, whose meaning was not so clear to me, or the meaning was nothing at all. So, quoting the best innovator of our time, Steve Jobs, 
I gave them an agreeable definition of what I consider innovation. And in reality, it's a physiological definition, but it's a true definition. That means that innovation, innovation is the only way to win. If you want, only if we maintain and achieve constantly the operational superiority with innovation, facing our adversary, we can win. And we military know it very well because the history of military innovation is at the end, the history of innovation. Even if we have to say the latest technology advancement are no longer driven by the military, but in reality by civilian company. From my point of view, innovation is important, but not just in our capability of adaptation development, but also in our way of thinking and decision-making process. Innovation for us, it's all about finding a way to achieve operational superiority, in other words. Military input and expertise coming from the field represent an essential factor for the best definition of the product itself, optimizing the outcome of the whole, of the whole value chain. In other words, it should always be the militaries to drive the change, asking for the capabilities they need to accomplish their task, which in the case of the European Union, for example, means that to fulfill the level of ambition defined at the political level, be able to defend European interests and its citizens. But in this age, driven by technology advancement, debate, discussion, and studies are welcome. It's also important for the military to understand how to integrate and adapt technologies in the military domain. But, one, but we must keep in mind that innovation in the military domain is different from the one in the civilian environment. Our main system is and will be the soldier, or if you want, the human factor. The human factor will be even more important in the next few years because also due to the Afghan fatigue, the Western society will be less and less ready to pay high costs as the war it is. So it will be up to us to make the fulfillment of, of our task according to political mandate and social will. But in my opinion, the most difficult task will be match our values to ever changing warfare. In fact, the time will change, but the real nature of war will not. Ultimately, its nature is made up of high human cost. A cost that, as I said, now the Western society are not ready to pay any longer. And this one is the reason why we are working on the upcoming military requirement that shall remain the main trigger for research and innovation in the defense sector, and also the basis for the armed forces to re-engineer themselves for success in the next generation of war fighting. And now, frankly speaking, I am much more comfortable talking about the maneuver of forces, how to direct fire on military diplomacy, then how military robots, that may be its future, will operate in the battlefield. Because honestly, I don't know, but I know the military robots will operate on the battlefield. And as you can imagine, I'm not an expert, but I understand some huge implication brought by technology's application in military affairs. Yes, because the fourth industrial revolution in the military affairs will reshape the idea of battlefield itself and the perception of the space in it. It seems clear to me that in the land domain, the army battlefield, the main application new system will occur in the last mile, those terrain where historically the troops have been incompetent. In parallel, we have to rethink the concept of mass concentration, at least for two reasons. First, let's say the quality of troops. The employment of traditional troops and their training will change deeply in the next few years. And after the quantity of troops, both traditional and unmanned, because probably we are going to have an unmanned troop. We won't be able to use unmanned system on the ground until we will not have an adequate number of them. That means until when we will not have a mass production. But if you want to go in this direction, we must avoid one of the diseases that until now is affecting the European defense, that is the fragmentation. We cannot see no building national robot as we did in the past with tanks, rifle fighters. This is about opposite of what we need. And as you know, the European Union is working through the European Defense Initiative, such as CDF, PESCO, EDP, to pass the fragmentation, providing financial tools and common political requirements. By the way, 
coming back to the future. We are not talking about automat automatization of robot systems, even less about automatic letter responses. We are talking of a kind of robot companion, a tool that will help the soldier in conducting his task. Well, let's conclude. Conclude, I like to highlight recalling that the next generation military system need many things, but for sure innovation. But we'll not have innovation without the perceived necessity, the urgency, clear guidance, clear operational requirement, and not less important, a bit of rational madness to pursue and grasp the future. Another thing, a consideration. NASA, NASA launched its first vector with a computer as big as a room, but less powerful than your current smartphone. But less than only 10 years before, the president launched the ambition not to land on the moon, but to win the space race. So it's all about Prevision. Trust me, I am old enough to say that without will, innovation is only technicalities. Therefore, we can only partially imagine what future holds in terms of technology. The very destructive technology, in particular, the artificial intelligence, has become a new focus of the international relations competition. We hear a lot about the need for Europe to be a geopolitical player. The ongoing European Defense Initiative are trying to fill the gap between words and deeds. And here we are, we are at the final definition that is the import of strategic autonomy, that as usual is not the autonomy from one, it is the autonomy of doing something alone, if necessary, with partner if possible. And also the import of strategic compass in order, in order to give direction how to run the CSDP mission operation and how to develop the future shaping of technology superiority. This one is another different conclusion. So, and I conclude here, waiting for to hear your contribution. Thank you. Thank you, General Graziano. Many thanks for your uh, keynote speech, and many thanks for uh, bringing a lot of relevant issues uh, on the table, and also to bring the, the EU perspective and, and context. Uh, my favorite takeaways of your speech have been, uh, without will, innovation is only technicalities, and strategic autonomy is not from someone but to do something alone if necessary. Very, very good point. Now, uh, let me open uh, with uh, our uh, great lineup, lineup of speakers. Each of them authored uh, one, or in the case of Ottavia, two chapters uh, in the AI study, the next generation soldier, a system of system approach. The study has been realized in partnership with Leonardo and Beretta companies. Each speaker has only five minutes for his or her speech and is encouraged to make a few key points in order to leave room for the debate with, uh, with the audience. And the audience is encouraged to make a question through uh, the function in the Zoom platform Q&A. I will filter and moderate the question during the, uh, the debate. Um, let's start with the first speaker, Carolina Muti. She is a researcher in both defense and security programs here at EI. And she co-edited the world publication with me and uh, did author a chapter, the first chapter of the study on strategic trends. Carolina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandro. The contemporary theater of conflict uh, is a complex multi-level multi and cross-sectoral environment where physical information technology and cognitive dimensions interact and need to smoothly be integrated to be effective. <coughs> this, of course, poses a significant challenge even to the most advanced armed forces. The coexistence of asymmetrical and hybrid warfare is an, in an increasingly congested and urban scenarios in, is another element that complicates the understanding of the contemporary battlefield with consequences for doctrine, planning, and training. The need for more interdisciplinary, multidimensional approach collides at the, at the same time with the growing number of components in the case of the next generation army. So a question arises on how the next generation soldier can adapt to this dimension and pace of current changes. 
the soldier uh, will be supported by technology, but will remain the backbone of the process. And how uh, a relation between the human and non-human components of this process can be um, developed is, is, is still uh, to, be, to be defined. Against this backdrop, artificial intelligence and machine learning come in support to complement human limitations. At the same time, the long-standing demand in Western societies for force protection has gradually influenced and oriented technical solutions towards an enhancement of both survivability and lethality of the soldier. The difficult balance between protection and mobility is another key element on the battlefield. Developments in the field of new materials here are promising in this sense. Power management and sustainability is another factor of uttermost importance for troops to operate effectively with more enduring batteries, for example. In parallel, communication acquires a new dimension, considering that it entails both communicating with other soldiers as well as with unmanned systems. In this context, developments in the field of virtual and augmented reality present new opportunities for training exercises and simulations in order to complement but not substitute the conventional training. The next generation soldier is a fitting example of how a combination of old and new elements will characterize the conflicts of the future by bringing a number of question marks. New technologies improve situational awareness, survivability and lethality of the soldier together with solve precision and range. But at the same time, an over-reliance on technology, especially on those related to communication systems, is a source of vulnerability uh, in case of command and control and communication disruption. Electronic warfare in this sense shows how the dismounted soldier needs to be capable of both using such connected equipment and to operate with damaged communication in case of necessity. The need for better integration of these complex systems, as well as of multi multidimensional interdisciplinary approach, is at odds with the fragmentation caused by the number of subcomponents. This poses a concrete challenge for equipment interoperability among alliance and partners in the context of NATO and EU missions. Effective action in such a changed and ever connected battlefield with blurred lines between war and peace, combatants and non-combatants, civilian and military, will require next generation strategic thinking, concepts, doctrine and training. Moreover, it will likely imply the creation of new cross-sectorial civilian military partnerships, as well as of new competences and figures, not only highly specialized, but also capable of putting together all the pieces of the puzzle. And uh, I will pass the floor now back to Alessandro. Thank you, Carolina, for your very uh, good and uh, concise synthetic uh, overview. Uh, on this basis, now we uh, begin with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a parade of national uh, case studies. And we start from the US case study with uh, Scott Boston from Rand Corporation. Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Scott Boston and uh, I, I work for Rand. I wanted to issue a disclaimer up front that um, although uh, we do uh, work officially for the US Army, uh, in this case, uh, my remarks are drawn from entirely uh, um, like Army open sources and, and statements. Um, and also, um, although there are some very interesting things uh, going on, uh, including at the, the specific soldier technology level uh, in Special Operations Forces and the uh, US Marine Corps, uh, these remarks are, are, are specifically focused for the U.S. Army. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few things uh, uh, this morning over the next uh, four minutes. 
Uh, I'm going to initially talk a little bit about the adaptive squad architecture, which is the Army's approach for how it's thinking about uh, soldier systems holistically. Uh, I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking about some situational awareness and situational understanding uh, improvements, uh, particularly focused on the new, the new goggles, the, um, what they're called IVAS. Um, and I'm going to uh, complete by talking about uh, some of the other uh, important areas um, that are also going to be fitting into um, sort of the squad architecture approach that the Army is taking. So the United States Army has um, continued to stick with a, a, a a nine soldier infantry squad uh, across all of its different formations. And it, and it thinks very much about um, soldier equipment in the context of the squad. Um, uh, as a, uh, It is sort of the, the centerpiece of what they call the close combat force, which also includes the scout squad, board observers, combat engineers, and, and medics. And so um, all of what I'm about to, to speak to is, is sort of focused on that, that selection, um, but, but I would say principally um, the, what they call the, the 7,000 squads of the U.S. Army, um, in, you know, including infantry, uh, scouts, and otherwise. Um, so they have a squad-focused approach. Um, the, the currently, what, what they, they have a cross-functional team focused on soldier lethality that um, is, among other things, thinking through how do you ad adapt new technologies in a modular way, and what are the common approaches so that you can have uh, what they call the right hooks, the you know common batteries, uh, a wireless network, um, and, and other things that allow you to think through what do you do at the soldier level in order to rapidly field capabilities that they're actually going to want and use, um, and that are generally not going to increase um, the the weight of a soldier's load. Um, the centerpiece of the soldier lethality effort has been. Uh, a situational awareness effort um, that's primarily focused on fielding of what they what they call the Integrated Visual Augmentation System or IVAS. Um, this is a, a next generation um, goggle. It is it both it it both takes some of the capabilities of past goggles, so it it fuses um, infrared and low light capabilities on a single image. But it also is, is being adapted to use uh, a lot of new capabilities in, in the realm of augmented reality. Um, so the intent is that you have a single way to project to the soldier um, control measures. So you can designate um, you know, fields of fire or adversaries. You can give them a lot of situational information. Um, they have recently experimented, for example, with the ability to share like full motion video from a vehicle that a soldier is riding. So uh, Project Convergence um, this year, they first demonstrated the ability to share the information from a helicopter sensors to the IVAS. Um, so the intent is training and rehearsals and, and combat can all be done um, with this goggle set. Um, this all focuses on trying to build um, the ability for, for soldiers to train as they fight. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and working through this with an experimental way because the amount of complexity that you have to manage with something like this is, is, is remarkable. So a lot of experimentation, uh, it's a very expensive effort. Uh, the contract with Microsoft for IVAS is uh, $22 billion. Um, they're, there's, uh, they're, they're pushing forward on that. Um, there's uh, been a little resistance from, from Congress on that. And so that's one of the things that they're they're working through, um, but that is sort of the core effort. Um, and, and the last minute that I have here to talk, um, I wanna talk about the other factors uh, that they're looking at. So the, the, the other key thing is a next generation soldier weapon, um, NGSW, uh, you may have seen the acronym. It is a new rifle and a new squad weapon that has basically is based around new ammunition with much higher kinetic energy. The intent is to increase the effective range um, by about you know, 50%, um, they're adding sound suppression so that soldiers communi communicate more effectively and the signature is reduced. Um, and the other areas that they're, uh, that they're working through is um, improvements to body armor and soldier level robotics. Uh, in particular, the soldier born sensor, which is a system called Black Hornet. It's a well handheld um, uh, drone. So um, that is actually my five minutes. Uh, and so I'm turning over Back to Alessandro. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for uh, for these uh, insights. 
uh, you know, from Italian and European perspective, uh, is always uh, interesting and good to have uh, uh, an insider view on what's going on uh, in Washington. And, um, and with the same spirit of having uh, uh, a taste, a flavor from the capitals, so we move uh, to London, to Nick Reynolds from Royal United Services Institute for the UK case study. Nick, the floor is yours. Um, Alessandro, thank you for the introduction. Um, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Um, excellent. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just briefly outline the context for the British Army um, and how they're approaching soldier modernization and what capabilities are being developed. Uh, then my chapter also makes reference to the Royal Marines and other services who have, whose efforts are intertwined with those of the Army. Now, early in 2021, the Ministry of Defence uh, released the Integrated Review and Defence Command paper. And these, I feel, are a good place to start because they establish the overall intent that the British Armed Forces uh, should fulfil over the next five years and beyond after a period of uncertainty. Now, these strategic documents, they were based on previous initiatives, albeit many of these were not top level. Um, but the direction of travel is broadly the same. Uh, there are not too many surprises, um, but, you know, the, the review added clarity. Notably, the review included an uplift in funding and articulated the intent uh, for the British Army to restructure. Uh, there was also a notable emphasis on C4 ISR capabilities, uncrewed systems, electronic warfare and cyber capabilities. Now, putting the review into practice will be challenging. The British Armed Forces are shrinking and the uplift in funding um, that came as part of it, it only goes part way to addressing previ previous budget deficits and a lack of modernization. There are also difficult structural changes that must be taken into account. The British Army aims to uh, persistently engage abroad and have a widely deployed footprint of small teams uh, from both the new Army Special Operations Brigade and the Security Force Assistance Brigade working with partners and allies. Um, this is perhaps the biggest structural change from the reviews and uh, it especially influences the C4 ISR systems that the Army must build. Um, new capabilities such as sensors, uncrewed systems and support from AI and machine learning and the way that these connect or network, they must not only be suitable for larger warfighting formations, but also for small teams operating with minimal support. Um, so two conflicting imperatives, and uh, also none of these capabilities have yet been implemented. Now, the core of soldier modernization is intended to be networking. Ongoing initiatives such as Project Morpheus and Project Thea are an integral part of this. They cover the next generation of C2 and digitization respectively, though it isn't clear exactly what they will deliver yet but they are intended to network the force, get the right information from place to place, link sensors and shooters, and allow personnel at different echelons to draw on information more readily. Capabilities within that, such as mobile ad hoc networks for tactical use are being explored, and some new systems have started to be adopted as part of the interim updating of the existing Bowman Tactical Comms Network. Now it's worth mentioning that what is probably the biggest area for exploration is uncrewed systems. The British Army and other services are leaning into these heavily. So what drives this? Now, the British Armed Forces predict that the future battle space will be increasingly dispersed and intermingled, and that fighting must be done in depth throughout that space. Um, so uncrewed aerial systems, um, as part of this, they will provide better situational awareness, and the focus of experimentation has been on small systems. Initially, perhaps three to four years ago, they were mainly experimenting with nano UAS platforms for small units to conduct near area, near area surveillance only though more recent iterations of that experimentation have included comparatively large systems that can carry small effectors and that can satellite further from the units that are operating them. There's also a focus on linking these to long range fires to better fight that deep battle. Meanwhile, unmanned ground vehicles are uh, being explored. Um, they aim to keep, the, to keep ground units mobile while still allowing them to carry the right capabilities and reduce the risk to Herman personnel at key points. Um, for example, logistics UGVs, which are the focus of, uh, of um, most recent experimentation that can resupply forces, um, these are in response to other issues that deep battle space, such as maintaining ground lines of communication that will be more vulnerable to attack or uh, contestation. And so using them as a solution is designed to, um, to reduce the uh, placing of human personnel at risk. So part of the way the British Army aims to achieve this is by, bot by bottom-up experimentation. Um, models such as buy and try at scale, whereby units at the battalion level and below are given equipment to trial, is designed to address issues with slow procurement cycles, not keeping up with technological change. Now, it's important to flag that uh, just over two weeks ago, the British Army's uh, future soldier program was presented publicly. 
Um, despite the overlapping terminology, uh, the focus of that program goes beyond soldier modernization um, and includes things like talent and career management, uh, families, communities, among other things. And so not, it's not entirely analogous uh, with the content of my chapter, um, which is largely to do with the operational aspects of modernization. Nevertheless, as a step towards um, a step towards implementing the integrated review um, and where the focus did overlap, it turns out to be largely in alignment with, with my research in terms of the aspirations that it articulates. Um, and to summarize um, what I found, um, the UK still unfortunately has a long way to go. All of the proposed changes and upgrades are dependent on the C2 network architecture being put into place. From there, other, other specific capabilities can be integrated with or plug into this network. Um, but not only has this not yet happened, but delivery will take time. Nevertheless, the need for change is recognized and the concepts are starting to cohere sufficiently to establish clear requirements. So there is cause for cautious optimism. Um, and yeah, so with that, uh, thank you very much, much for your time and I will hand back to the chair and the next speaker. Thank you, Nick. And, uh, and, and many thanks indeed for this uh, sober, honest review of the British approach. I, I took some notes, including about uh, uh, bottom-up experimentation, which sounds familiar to me, also with respect to, to other case studies. So, um, now let's, let's cross the channel, which is uh, not that easy in this period. Let's focus on, uh, on France, on the French case study with uh, Bruno Lasalle, Fondation pour la Research Stratégique. Bruno, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Alessandro. Uh, in general, uh, Alessandro, uh, Francesca, Carolina, hello everyone. Uh, I am pleased to join you for this presentation from France. Forgive me for my poor mastery of the language of Shakespeare. For his uh, understanding, you, you can follow my presentation by following it on the slides of the PowerPoint presentation. The challenge of modernizing combatants' equipment. There is three challenges. First is no break between the combat on board and disembark. The second is effective in both high and low intensity combat. And the third is established itself as an international reference, which always uh, the man in center of the problem. The man is the first project. To meet this uh, challenge, there is three factors. First key factor is exploit the successes of the combat proven finance system which is the actual system in the French forces. To exploit its successes, it's important first make the new system more open, universal, and flexible. Then ensure close compatibility with the Scorpion system and its evolutions. The Scorpion system is uh, is uh, the, 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 the mind system today in the uh, ground army. And then the favoring modularity and adaptation to technological innovation. The second key factor is oriented to the, uh, the modernization and the innovation. In complement with institutional innovation inherent in army programs of the DGA, it's important to benefit from short loop innovations. This is possible in France, thanks to the innovation acceleration platform, which is named Centurion. You can easily Find this platform on the internet. The third factor is the problem of robotic. To abort this, uh, this robotic, 
friends made a Vulcan section. This Vulcan section identifies the potential of robotic alongside the most dismounted fighter and work to design robots partners consistent with ethical rules. And as you say, at first, the man is always in center of the study, in center of all what is made to strengthen the, the forces and this uh, scheme is uh, put the man in center of all the uh, scorpion, Vulcan, battlefield experience feedback, Felin, Innovation Centurion, Defense Ethics Committee. The very, it's very important to put the man in center of all the action because it's a key to win. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, thank you well for, for, for your speech and also for your very uh, clear PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the, the, the key points of the French uh, uh, approach uh, have resonated uh, very uh, round and clear uh, here, here in Rome and, uh, and through the audience. So let's move now uh, exactly to, uh, to Italy and to the Italian case study and uh, a few hints also on, uh, on uh, the European and transatlantic level with the next speaker, Ottavia Credi. She's, she, she's a junior researcher at TI in both defense and security programs. And, um, and I'm really proud of the fact that the EI team on this study uh, shows a good uh, uh, gender balance. Ottavia, the floor is yours. Good evening or morning for those joining from the US. And thank you for the opportunity to intervene in this webinar. Uh, so in the next few minutes, I will present the findings concerning the situation in Italy on which I worked together with Alessandro and then shortly move on to provide an overview of the EU and the NATO frameworks. So the Italian army is well aware of the fact that the scenarios in which its land forces will be called to intervene are bound to change over time and that its troops need to adapt their equipment accordingly. In an effort to predict the types of the situations in which its forces will be called to operate, the army investigated the most likely operational scenarios that will characterize the post-2035 environment, as well as the capabilities that will be needed in order to succeed in such scenarios. And it found that such situations could be categorized in three main types of operational environments, namely coastal regions, areas that are contested for the control of essential resources and the so-called megacities, which are areas deriving from an intensive process of globalization leading to severe consequences at urban level. All of these scenarios will have two main things in common. Firstly, no matter the type of environment in which they will be called to operate, Italian land forces will likely have to face asymmetrical conflicts often characterized by the presence of hybrid threats. The second critical aspect consists in the fact that the primary role in all military operations will be assigned to the commander. As a matter of fact, Italy is committed to always placing the human element at the very center of its missions. This entails adhering to a human in the loop approach, which despite highly valuing the advantages brought by innovative technological applications, still considers the human component as the core of military activities. Italy is also investing a lot of effort in procurement activities aimed at ensuring its troops the best possible equipment. The main procurement channel for military innovation consists in the so-called individual combat system, also known as ICS, namely a program created from the synergy between the armed forces and the national industries. The ICS could be defined as an integrated weapon apparatus aimed at improving five main soldiers' capabilities, namely protection, survivability, command and control, nocturnal mobility, and lethality. The suppliers of the ICS are grouped in a consortium functioning as one, as one single industrial counterpart for the army, once again demonstrating the tight collaboration between the two parts. 
The Italian Ministry of Defense recently announced a consistent investment in the ICS, and thanks to the resources devoted to the program, Italy has since been working on several technological applications which are likely to influence the way in which Italian soldiers will operate in the future. To conclude this overview on the Italian case, I would like to point out both at a challenge and a warning for future developments. One major challenge the army will have to face is related to the concept of system of systems. Italy considers the dismounted soldier as a system per se, since soldiers are equipped with a set of tools that are integrated in their equipment, which they personally employ and control. At the same time, though, the soldier is part of a broader, more vast system of systems, namely the squad, in which every member has different yet complementary functions. The challenge is thus ensuring soldiers will become increasingly multi-role while being integrated in a broader system, which will be required to operate in different, very complex domains. And now a warning, an increase in capabilities that not always equal an increase of efficiency, nor protection or agility. Given the vast avail availability of technological innovations that are applicable to the military realm, the army risks being overwhelmed. Therefore, going forward, the army should reflect on one very crucial question, namely when to stop technological enhancement. Turning now our attention to international organization, in the EU framework in the last few years, there has been one, uh, more than one project devoted to the enhancement and modernization of soldiers' equipment, starting uh, from the initiative carried out by European Defense Agency. One of the most relevant programs developed at EU level consists in the so-called um, GOSTRA program, which stands for Generic Open Soldier System Architecture. It was finalized last year and it was framed within uh, the preparatory action on defense research. Its three main objectives were developing new and innovative devices to enhance soldiers' equipment, improving European networking capability and command and control system at platoon level, and thirdly, enhancing the interaction between soldiers and vehicles. Still, there are several challenges the EU will face going forward. Um, at the European level, the digitalization of armed forces is slowly but surely changing the way in which member states are preparing for future conflicts. And that becomes very apparent when considering that emerges and, dis and disruptive technologies will be among the issues discussed in the EU strategic compass. Nevertheless, the EU lacks on the one hand, a clear data pictures for, for its armed forces digitalization. And on the other hand, an investment plan able to properly support developments in this area. Another challenge pertains to data sharing among military forces, which EU member states need to improve in order to improve their own interoperability. Differently from the EU, lately the Atlantic Alliance has not paid, paid much attention to the issue of uh, soldiers' equipment, with no ongoing initiatives in the field. Yet there is talk about um, setting a standard for the equipment of the next generation soldiers, uh, which will be known as the NATO uh, generic soldiers architecture. Moreover, in the last few years, NATO has been investing, uh, investigating the impact of ETDs on allied military operations, as well as possible uses of artificial intelligence, automation, and robotics in the military domain. Going forward, NATO is committed to inaugurating a standardization agreement for the development of the next generation soldier system. Such a goal, however, will only be achieved if allies will enhance the degree of interoperability and cooperation within the alliance, especially as far as information sharing and technology transfer are concerned. And with this, I conclude my presentation and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ottavia. Thank you for, uh, for presenting very well the Italian case studies and also for uh, the, uh, the hints of NATO and EU level. Often in Italy, there is uh, much more going on than what appears on the international press. And uh, with this chapter, we wanted to uh, communicate in English a comprehensive uh, uh, overview of the uh, doctrinal uh, procurement uh, R&D efforts uh, in, uh, uh, in Italy. Uh, now, I saw a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A uh, function of Zoom. I do encourage other participants to write their brief comments or question to be picked up by, uh, by the panelists uh, after we end the roundtable. Now let's move to Israel. 
which is uh, the only non-NATO country we decided to include in our study because of its unique operational and technological experience when it comes to infantry and particularly the dismounted soldier. So I'm very glad to give the floor uh, to Michael Shurkin for Shurbros Global Strategies. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, uh, I thought that uh, listening to the presentations, I thought it worth highlighting that there's a, an interesting difference between, certainly between the Israeli approach and uh, what I know to be the French approach. Uh, because I believe with France, the emphasis now is on trying to recapture the ability to fight large wars. So they're going from Scorpion to something called Titan, which is about basically leveraging collaborative warfare at a larger scale sort of division level or core level campaign. For the Israelis, the, it, the direction is obvious, is very much going in the opposite direction. What they've been trying to do is having kind of already been innovators with uh, sort of division level information operations and networking, they are very anxious to push it down the advantages of the technology down to the small squad level and and and, and below and not below, but the, as, as low down the echelon as, as they can. And this comes from a sense that, uh, at least for them, in distinction from where the NATO countries are thinking, you know, and NATO countries and, and the United States are thinking about big wars these days, uh, Israelis are sort of thinking that their days of large scale maneuver warfare might be over. And from now on, it's all going to be about fight, fighting in places like Gaza or southern Lebanon, where the fighting is taking place at a smaller scale and where they are convinced that they need to be adaptive, small, precise. They need to be make sure that they want to be able to leverage all of the synergies of the multi domains, right? Because, of course, they're also using this term. Uh, of the combined arms, the joint fires. They want to leverage all of it, but they want to be able to bring all of those fires and supports and benefits down to, to a guy with uh, an M16 in a fight in a house and to make sure that he can do it as quickly as possible. So it's all about trying to bring as much information as possible at the smallest level as possible and to have everything as fast and as precise as possible. And... So they've been doing it by adapting the larger information infrastructure that they already created. So starting already in around the year 2000, they developed something called Sayad, uh, which sort of means field. And they developed this sort of information architecture that's been described to me as something like the Android or the Apple, the iOS uh, operating system. And it's this basis upon which uh, then all these smaller companies and other companies are developing apps, if you will, that plug into this environment and then create special applications for certain kinds of things. But the idea is that if you have an app for artillery and an app for, I don't know what, like helicopters, that still because it's in the same environment, they can share information. And now what they've been doing is, so, so for instance, with their push, their desire to push things to the smaller scale, they have a company level app called Fireweaver. And the way Fireweaver is supposed to work is that Fireweaver is like an app, it's like very much like Uber, where um, if you're a, 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 you know, you're, you're a guy in a firefight in some house somewhere, you can share information with this app. And what the app is gonna do, the artificial intelligence is going to figure out, just as with Uber, artificial intelligence figures out which driver is best suited for picking you up and then taking you to wherever you wanna go. This app is designed to figure out which weapon system can take the shot, right? Uh, can deal with a threat and who's got the, the line of fire and can take the shot even though you can't necessarily do this. So the AI will do the work for you and then built into the AI is supposed to be information regarding um, things like the risk of collateral damage and the nature of the target and the rules of engagement. So that presumably if, if you're trying to, the AI will not task uh, an F-16 with a 2000 pound bomb to take care of a threat that requires something much smaller, right? So you're not gonna flatten an entire house. And so, but the idea is to make this as easy as possible for people as at the lowest a level as possible and then to network everybody so it's beyond combined arms and it becomes joint and all to make things as quick and fast as possible 
at the small scale. So in other words, the focus is here is on the micro battle and not on the larger battle, because they feel like for one thing that they already have the technology for the larger battle, for integrating in the division level operations, and also because they don't really feel like that that's really where the fire, where the, the fight has to be. And then the other thing that I, I want to stress is that they are very concerned with ergonomics because they realize that if, if you're in a firefight in a house in an urban setting, you don't have the time to pull out your tablet and, and mess around with your software. It needs to be as easy as possible. So they too are looking at uh, goggles and enhanced reality goggles. And they're developing systems also that are supposed to integrate something called Arcos, where you've got optics on your rifle, which are integrated with your goggles. And the idea is to make sure theoretically that you can target, you can see something, this information is shared with maybe the guy in the F-16 or the guy with, with the howitzer, but the information is shared, everybody has a common operating picture and is, is made as presentable as possible, all to sort of ease the burden on the the guy in the house in the firefight and to enable him to draw on the combined arms and, and the joint fires. Um, I think everybody else is more or less working on the same technology, but I think here there's a real important difference between the Israeli concern for the small scale urban fight, whereas I think with the NATO countries there's more and more of concern with the larger scale big maneuver fight since they've sort of decided that that's, that's the future threat, and that's where that they, they need to go. And I'll, I'll conclude there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for this very uh, interesting uh, and really, in my view, um, original insight on uh, on the Israeli Armed Forces uh, uh, approach and your your very very rich uh, your very rich uh, chapter. Okay, let's let's move uh, to uh, to the Q and A. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, in the the pleasure. And, and uh, of uh, um, General Salvatore Farina, uh, former Chief of Army Staff, of uh, joining us uh, in, uh, in the IAI headquarters for this debate. So I'm really uh, glad to give uh, first him the floor for his first uh, reaction to the, to the roundtable and his first uh, comments also in light of uh, his uh, uh, very long and important experience in the Italian Army. Uh, General Salvarina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and good evening, everybody, all the panelists. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting. Congratulations, first of all, for the study. It's uh, uh, very comprehensive, up to date, I have to say. And also, I listened to uh, the many uh, observations and items presented. And of course, uh, Gian Graziano said, uh, I agree, I couldn't agree more uh, of the fact that. Uh, uh, innovation is the only way to win and the military should lead uh, this process. Uh, uh, I would say yes, lead uh, means also that other are to be participant to this process. Uh, my first observation is uh, because sometimes we just uh, do not take note about this, the difference and the peculiarity of the land environment. The land environment is unique because you mentioned in the study the urbanization worldwide even more and more, you know, uh, everywhere, also in Africa, there will be, you know, the almost all the population in a few years will be in the very big mega cities, also in Africa. Uh, you can imagine in the other part of the world. This is, and the terrain is complex, is different from the sea and from the air, but also we have the presence on the land of the human. There is no human in the sky. There is no human possibly. Uh, I see, difficult, uh, of course. And, you know, we had to take into account about this, the complexity, and also the numbers of the operators. We are speaking about uh, just from the United States, uh, uh, Boston said 7,000 squad of nine people. You know, a huge number to be addressed, you know, it's important to understand how uh, important, how difficult is the exercise to solve this problem. But technology is not an option. Technology has driven every time through history, the military way of fighting. Technology is already here. We have to take into account this. Uh, we are speaking about, you know, a new technology, artificial intelligence is already present and so on, but it's already here. The question is, how to just translate this into effective, operational, efficient at soldiers' level, but also 
at you know low level and i appreciate very much the approach of many i think uh, almost all said that you know the bottom approach starting from the single soldier but i would say the squad the team the basic team that we had to take into account now the question is why in the last two decades and you posed the, the question on into the study why uh, without maybe giving a full answer uh, because it's a good thing why we uh, made only modest improvements in, in this area now i don't have the answer to, to, to the comprehensive answer, but I, I can say uh, that two big mistakes were made. First, to launch ourselves into the rush just to get the best technology tomorrow, tomorrow, the future, the future. This is a big mistake. We have to take into account and to introduce the available technology today to adapt it to the needs. So first thing. The second that I understand now many, uh, as uh, many uh, of us, all the countries almost they have introduced, is that we need to approach this technological innovation and the introduction of new technology, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, accompanied by concept, doctrine, and tactics. I think many uh, of the panelists mentioned this. I would like to stress this kind of thing. Why? Because we need the proof on the ground. So the military people, the commanders, uh, as I said, General Graziano, should take the lead and say, we need this. Keep it simple, because more than this will be, you know, wasteful or is not, uh, is more than enough. We need to, to, to fix a configuration and to go ahead. How can we be uh, just able to appreciate uh, the effectiveness. We have to uh, continuously uh, produce and run experimentation, research and development on the field, experimentation and trials. So uh, the Italian army, uh, the, the, the panelist, I think was Ottavia, probably, uh, she spoke about the concept made, so the future operational environment that was produced in 2019 by the Italian army fixed the full environment. So uh, the capability to fight in high intensity as well as asymmetric urban areas uh, dispersed, you know, kind of uh, uh, the, the, the task unit and, and the, the, the forces. I think they will be more dispersed and they have to intervene, concentrating the fire at their level, asking also for the fire. So we have to, to make these trials. I understand that the Italian army has signed a contract now with a, with a, uh, with a company that is introducing uh, robots, autonomous system, uh, small uh, nano, uh, micro kind of uh, UAVs for surveillance and also uh, for uh, uh, transportation of uh, burden and uh, also for uh, situation awareness as well. So this will be going on for a couple of years, but we have to take in, uh, advantage of what is coming out <laughs> of this. And the next question is, how will be the next platoon company unit composed is still you know, with three platoons, a 104, uh, whatever, with 100 people, or there is a reshuffle of the uh, task organization, the composition of the force. I think the basic formation should be the squad uh, uh, below nine, 10 people is not uh, convenient, but uh, what they can have, each one, you know, maneuvering uh, the, the UAV situation awareness, think about how to work in a urban environment to see what is happening into a building or to have beyond line of sight grenade for example a grenade launcher to be a mini missile that can hit you know the enemy uh, the adversary at 1000 meters this can be made you know it is possible even you know today or tomorrow but we have to think in this way and how also to include in the squad uh, a minimum level you know, also electronic kind, you know, awareness and cyber, uh, you know, security in the sense that not to be attacked. And then I think that the, uh, let's say, digitalization and the connectivity should be maintained at the lowest possible level. So the soldier doesn't need to be linked with a, a regiment commander. 
he needs to be seen and to be connected with the squad commander and from there uh, to, 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 uh, to the uh, superior level. So I think that the last point uh, has been uh, touched by many, the standardization, I think is high time for NATO and for European Union, uh, instead of launching a new, uh, you know, just frontier of technology, it is very good to launch a standardization of this system. Doesn't matter which brand company is the night, uh, the, 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 the vision goggles it could be, but as uh, the Israeli colleague was saying the, before, uh, the, the, I mean, next generation, is this, 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 and that, and then this standardization, has it happened in the past, could lead also other countries to do so. But, you know, I end up saying, take it now, introduce it now, because we need, absolutely, we need the, the soldier and the squad to be, the dismantled team to be equipped today, not to wait tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, General Farina. Thank you very much for for your your comments very insightful and uh, i do recognize there is a, there are different approaches in different countries uh, object of the study and probably in the range italy and israel uh, lie at the opposite uh, of the degree of connection of the individual soldier but we, we can discuss about it now let me pick uh, uh, four questions made on the chat and turn to the to the speakers to the various speakers um massimiliano spookers uh, make Congrats, congratulations for the webinar and the study. Thank you very much. And ask how nations, NATO and the European Union can harmonize their uh, efforts uh, with the reference also to NATO defense planning process. Well, on the, on the NATO side, uh, the NDPP, the NATO defense planning process is probably uh, good enough. This is something that uh, uh, was mentioned in the chapter by Ottavio and me, but goes also beyond the, the, the chapter itself. Uh, but probably NATO itself relies uh, a lot on the directions uh, to be taken, be taken by, by the, its, its major, major members. members. So therefore, therefore uh, US, UK, France, Germany, and, and Italy, and that will be important on a number of things, just things to the caliber of individual weapon and to the reflection in the US in, the, uh, in this regard. On the, on the EU side, I will kindly ask to General Graziano to, to comment on the effort to, uh, to harmonize, uh, to overcome the fragmentation in this field. Um, and after, let me also pick up the question by uh, Simon Sundarai Keun on what role robotics and drones will play in supplement uh, the shortage of the human capital, of the human resources for the army. And uh, I think this question is for, for, for several author, authors of the case studies, including uh, uh, Michael uh, Shurkin, who started already to reply. And their question for this batch is from Nicolas Perakis. It's about uh, the future of uh, main battle tank in warfare. This question goes a bit beyond, again, the study, but it's connected. And I think that uh, uh, probably some of the panelists uh, would uh, uh, comment on it and maybe also General Graziano itself. So to sum up, how to harmonize efforts, what roles robotics and drones uh, will play in supplement the human capital shortage, and what's the future of main battle tank, I would say, in connection with the uh, individual soldier. I will give the floor first to General Graziano for his uh, uh, whatever point he wants, and then to the panelists. Well, thank you so much. Very interesting. <clears throat> of course, now we are speaking about innovation, not what it is today. <clears throat> so about uh, research and development, the future. But as I said before, the important thing is to have system flexible enough to implement uh, the future implementation, the future innovation, uh, artificial intelligence at all level. Of course, the uh, future uh, soldier system uh, is more in uh, in. Uh, configuration so <clears throat> maybe you need even more in, in uh, imagination because it's more difficult than implementing in a main battle tank now of course uh, uh, the cooperation between NATO and European Union, Union it's one of the key elements of the strategic compact we hope is getting better and better in this moment at the tactical level we need to improve a little bit of course uh, in European Union uh, the, the, the push is actually uh, 
for the main project that can support uh, the new strategic compound and new, uh, let's say, uh, European capability on the operational side. The other is to uh, push for the European uh, know-how and for the national uh, for the European industry. Uh, the soldier is very important, this project, but I have seen uh, is very different from a member state to the other. So in order to have a, a real development uh, as European Union project, we should converge in something <clears throat> that is, uh, if not unique, at least share uh, within the different countries. The point that these projects are already in the field. The important thing actually, actually is uh, that these uh, systems are able to interoperate each other and to work each other and to be in an open system. And the big question is going to be how we work on the cyber and the big uh, uh, data process uh, in the big satellite because this system are going to be connected. I don't know to what level we have to limit the communication between the, uh, the team and the squad because theoretically in this moment uh, with the technology, etc., uh, the squad can report to the army commander. So it's a, it's a matter of limitation, but also of mental limitation to enter in this system, not easy. But uh, it's, uh, it's also connected to the main battle tank, to refer to the member battle tank, of course. The main battle tank, it's probably one of the key uh, European projects, EDF project connected to the, let's say, heavy system. It's not the, just the main battle tank, it's the new fighting vehicles. But it's something that in this moment that is very important, does not exist. So if you refer to the main battle tank, don't think to one, tank, uh, one bigger tank than today, or a tank that is heavier or something like that. It's completely, it's something that is going to come to change uh, the system like the sixth generation fighter, like the F-35 change for the airplane in different materials, different equipment, with different connection with artificial intelligence, for sure a different connection with uh, the uh, infantry system or the soldier system. I truly believe that it's going to be a game changer in the future. Uh, now it's, I repeat, it's going to change and going to come. We need the innovation to think how it's going to be in order to implement the future soldier connected with it. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great effort. It's very connected, very important. Uh, for the main battle time, probably it's easier to find the cooperation within uh, the European industry and rather than for, uh, uh, the, honestly speaking, the future soldiers. Thank you, General. Thank you very much. Very interesting points also on the relation between main battle tank and uh, and the infantry. Uh, I'll 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 give the floor to the uh, to the panelists, and uh, uh, maybe I will start with the, with the reverse order. So uh, Michael first, then Ottavia, Bruno, Nick, Scott, and Carolina. If anyone wants to pick up any question, Michael. Sure. I mean. Um... There's just one thing I wanted to add that I don't think anybody's mentioned this problem that I don't think any of these militaries has really been able to answer, which is how realistic it is to be investing so much in these information systems when when we have no reason to think that the information networks are going to remain secure or or viable in, in any kind of serious war. And I think that with the IDF, with the Israelis, it, it becomes, it's somewhat easy because they, they're not fighting the Russians. Although even against the against Hezbollah, they've found that they're sophisticated enough that they can game things. But I think that it's something that NATO countries don't really talk about enough, uh, that the more they invest in the technology and in effect, that actually makes them even more vulnerable. So I just want to put that out there. Um, for other things too that we've seen, uh, I, you know, I've already sort of responded to the one question. I think main battle tanks have a very bright future, but I think that the main battle tanks are going to be sort of networked with, with drones and all sorts of stuff that are going to be part of it. And it's all about figuring out how to integrate the, the information and how to integrate the operations in a way uh, that's very useful and, and robots too. And some of it will be to make up with shortfalls with human capital, but then also uh, I, I think that there's some real advantages there because uh, if robots are killed, that means that people aren't killed. And so that's that's an obvious win for, for militaries. Um, I'll pass the mic on to, to the next person. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Let me just briefly uh, give the floor to General Graziano, who has a, a flight uh, to catch. 
uh, very soon. So he's just going to greet us and then I'll return to the speakers. Well, I want to, to, to thank all of you for this very interesting uh, uh, for this very interesting panel. I don't want to, I cannot thank all, all of you, but uh, Professor Marone, uh, my friend uh, Salvatore Farina and all the others from uh, the AI, thank you so much for this briefing. Sorry, I have to go to, I do I have to go back to Brussels. All the best uh, and uh, all the best for these uh, important projects. Thank you, General. Thank you very much. Uh, we continue the uh, the round of replies uh, to the to the audience. So, Ottavia, you want to make some points? Yeah, just quickly uh, picking up the point, the question that was yes, asked yeah. concerning uh, the role of um, robotics and drones. I uh, just wanted to to draw the audience's attention on um, sticking to the Italian case on the fact that this system and more, more specifically. Um, AI applications, uh, nano, mini, and micro unmanned vehicles, so drones, have actually been recognized as among the priorities on which Italy is supposed to invest in the next few years. And that is deemed very important because by um, making by taking steps forward in the field of AI applications, the military um, is, is going to be able to employ this system for the analysis of the data that are going to be gathered by the drones themselves. Um, and this once again illustrates in a way uh, the Italian army's emphasis on actually protecting soldiers um, on the field by employing um, systems such as drones and AI applications that are able to not only enhance um, some of the uh, abilities, uh, but also to um, minimize the risks on uh, dismounted soldiers. Thank you, Ottavia. Thank you. Bruno, do you want to make any point? Yes. What seems important today is to avoid technological surprise. Uh, the, the technological surprise is uh, about uh, drones, about uh, robots, and uh, it's important to, to avoid this uh, eventual surprise while respecting the human, uh, particularly uh, ethics rules. And this is a real, a real problem for the uh, next years because uh, we, we make the fighter benefit from the best technologies, especially when it's disembarked. In what proportion the robots, robots partners, uh, uh, will supplement humans' resources is, uh, I think, a really uh, interrogation for the, the next future. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Nick, any point from your side? Um, yes, I've got a few points. Um, I suppose on the NATO and EU interoperability, just go them in order. Um, one thing that did strike me was um, from that uh, perspective, um, to improve interoperability across that al the alliance, um, I mean, obviously, there's an issue of network architecture. Um, build, building a network that all all NATO members can plug into is pretty critical to um, getting NATO to work as a coalition as a whole. And I think there are issues there with the disparity between the capabilities of different NATO members. Um, you know, for uh, smaller nations such as uh, the UK, um, or sorry, I should say, medium-sized nations, um, you know, such as the UK or France or Italy. Uh, there's both um, interoperability up with the United States and they're much more capable, um, you know, network systems, but then also op um, interoperating downwards with some of the newer NATO members, um, particularly some of the smaller post um, former Soviet bloc countries. Um, you know, given sort of that disparity, um, yeah, there are there are serious um, technical challenges there. But um, also there are the issues of, um, you know, just trust and understanding exactly how each other's systems uh, work. So, you know, exactly where those sort of networks need to be leveraged and uh, where conversely different sovereign capabilities can kind of just stand alone. Um, and the only way to really get around that is to be um, habituated to interoperating. So there's both a kind of technological angle, but there's also the much more practical one of just working together more. Um, moving on to robotics and drones. Um, uh, not a huge amount, nothing groundbreaking to add from me, apart from, you know, aside from the element of, you know, de-risk, you know, reducing human risk and with, a, you know, how the dispersed battlefield will operate. But I'd also say that drones 
they bring the issue of lethality. Um, you know, they, drones, um, they can make a force very, very lethal, including much lighter forces. And I think that has implications for the heavy armor question, which I would like to address in a little bit more depth. Um, so I agree with Michael, um, MB, main battle tanks and heavy armor will continue to be important, um, certainly at least for the next decade, although beyond that, you know, we can start to raise questions. Um, however, there are issues of survivability um, due to the threats that have been outlined, um, particularly uh, sort of, you know, unmanned aerial vehicles, smarter anti-tank um, weaponry, um, and, you know, long range precision fires. Um, the effectiveness of countermeasures have ultimately, even as they've been advancing and been invested in, they have lagged behind the advances in anti-armor weapons. Simply creating better anti-armor weapons is not as great a technical challenge as building good countermeasures. Um, so protecting tanks have become more difficult, although, um, as we've seen in more recent case studies, such as the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, um, I think that raised a lot of uh, questions about armor survivability. However, we also saw some very poor tank tactics and um, poor combined arms integration. Now, getting those things right can cover many of the vulnerabilities. But what we do need to accept, if we're talking about heavy armor, is that we need to accept losses and attrition. You know, the US and the UK in recent conflicts have become habituated to heavy armor being near 100% survivable. Um, that is no longer the case. And not just the heavy armor, but the system support, the maintenance and the resupply in particular, you know, these heavy armored forces have a large footprint, a very intensive, uh, very intensive maintenance and resupply requirements, and that has a large signature, and that's vulnerable to attack. So armored forces, you know, they need to update their tactics and they need to, uh, they need to update how they're supported to remain viable. Um, I think there, actually, Michael's point, I'm very glad he raised, um, Michael, that you raised electronic warfare and cyber vulnerability. I think that's a big issue about when you're fighting a deep battle. It's not just the kind of visual signature from drone surveillance, but also, the, you know, the um, the C2 structures that heavy armored forces in particular would generate all the electronic activity from communicating and trying to coordinate those effects. Um, those create a big signature, and um, that is something that can that can be um, targeted by a force that has a capable electronic warfare capability. Um, so yeah, there are issues to get around. Um, I think ultimately, if um, you know, it has been mentioned that lighter forces, fielding force multipliers such as drones and um, and advanced anti-armor weapons, they can be highly lethal, including to heavy, heavy forces. And but there are still things that only heavy forces can do, particularly when the sort of the force multipliers that lighter forces would rely on, um, you know, to bring those force multipliers to bear is dependent on, um, you know, the C2 structures, which are ultimately a dependency in the context of a contested electromagnetic spectrum. Um, heavy forces are the only ones that have the mobility and pack uh, the firepower organically to them, not off-boarded and not reliant on other echelons or other units to the left or right flank that you need to be communicated with. They're the only ones who can really punch through and exploit openings that they create by themselves. So a force that sort of goes lighter and doesn't have heavy armor is um, ultimately able, less able to offensively maneuver. Um, so, but how, how, how those things, how those issues will be worked around um it's an open question you know there are there are ser very serious issues about survivability that still need to be addressed so yeah on that note i'll hand i'll hand over thank you thank you nick for for your uh, clarity uh honesty realism and also a bit of irony um scott any any point from washington dc yeah i'm gonna echo a few remarks that have already been made um and particularly, I really uh, liked some of the comments that, that Nick just made um, as a, a fellow fan of um, uh, the utility of heavy forces um, in, in context. Um, I think the thing that that's, has stuck out to me repeatedly, and I'm definitely not the first person who ever said this, but when you think about your focus on the near peer threat versus the, well, I wouldn't say low intensity, but if you're looking at a, um, um, dealing with armed groups as opposed to large nation states with substantial uh, high-end capabilities, um, almost, almost ironically, the higher technology of the adversary in a lot of respects, the lower technology um, your, your tactics may need to be. There are things that, at, a certain, at least at a certain level of technology, there are things that will work against a lower technology adversary that um, that will that like you know you can emit against the lower technology adversary emitting against um, uh, against the Russians for example will give away your location um, 
on, on, on some level, a lot of this will, will end up boiling down to, um, you know, you need to maintain trust. You need to have pre-planned and, 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 and rehearsed and done all of these things in advance so that you don't need to use all these exotic communications to be able to do the things that, um, you know, that, that you need to do in, in combat. Um, and all of this is, I think, taking place as we're seeing a transition. And I don't think we're there yet. And, and I'm, not, I'm not someone who's on this, but I think we're moving into an era where um, reconnaissance fires and reconnaissance strike are, are this just increasingly dominant factor in how con combat is decided. And you know, hiding is is going to become you know, send, uh, signature management is going to become so much more important um, as both sides will have the ability to strike one another, um, and and deeper into the depth of both uh, of, of both sides, um, you know, physical locations as well, um, and you know, so it, we end up with problems like, well, we need the heavy force for its protected mobility and its lethality. Um, but our ability to sustain it is now a huge problem. And so what is the new balance of those things? And, and, and for, for the context of, of this work, um, what is the appropriate mix of infantry or, or, or soldier level capabilities that makes the most sense um, you know, for, for, the, for the range of missions that you look at? And so um, in particular, that, that issue of the, the adversary that you fight dictates how you can use some of these technologies is a huge issue. Uh, that's all I gotta say. Many thanks. Uh, many thanks, Scott. And now let's close the roundtable with Carolina. Thank you, Alessandro. I just want to add about the role of robotics and drones uh, in supplementing human capital shortages. Um, from a more broader and long-term perspective, the, the human capital shortage um, uh, can be also addressed from um, with the ability of armed forces to attract and, first of all, retain highly skilled personnel, which is, which is an issue today. So, um, of course, robotics and drones, uh, as my uh, as my previous colleagues already said, uh, are play a crucial role, but in the long term, uh, the uh, armies have to be more attractive for, for uh, young people uh, and uh, to attract right competences that are needed. Um, and here uh, they are competing with the private sector. So this will be an issue uh, in the mid to long term and it already is. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. We are running late. So I take the liberty to select just one more question from uh, the Q&A chat from uh, Danilo Mattera, who asks to elaborate more on European Defense Agency and the European Defense Fund efforts on a next generation soldier. Ottavia, I guess this, uh, uh, this question is straight for you. You have just one minute uh, uh, be, be telegraphic. All right, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Thank you for the question. So I'll dive right into the role of the EDA, the European Defense Agency. Um, by stating that uh, DDA definitely did have um, uh, an important role in this field. It, have, it was involved in the development of the, gen the next generation soldiers architecture for quite some time. Um, it worked on the joint investment program on innovative concepts and emerging technologies through which it explored new systems such as energy harvesting technologies and remote detection system. But it also worked on the project team uh, 21st century soldier system, which led to an in-depth analysis of technologies in the area of energy, survivability, human factors and observation. However, it is important to point out that the project was not entirely successful due to the member states inability to find common ground on their respective national industry solution, which once again demonstrates the importance for you member states to cooperate in the field of defense and military innovation. Turning to the European Defense Fund, uh, the 2021 round of calls for action offers several opportunities for cooperation in the sector, uh, which, uh, with numerous calls on innovative military personal protective equipment, beyond line of sight military systems, and application for enhancement of soldiers for protection, just to name a few. Um, as you probably all know, the EDF also had two precursor programs, uh, namely the European Defense Industrial Development Program and the Preparatory Action on Defense Research. In the content of the former, on, 
of the former between 2019 and 2020, there was an action grant for the promotion of SMEs in the market of defense technologies modernization. Um, while in the, in the context of the preparatory action, as well as uh, GOSTRA, which I talked about earlier, uh, another very uh, relevant project was Vestlife, um, which developed an ultralight modular bulletproof integral solution for the demount, dismounted soldier protection. Uh, sorry if I went very quickly, this answers all your questions and I, yeah, I'm available for further explanation. Thank you, Tavia, for being very detailed in a very few minutes. We are now going to close uh, the webinar. So let me thank uh, sincerely again uh, all the speakers for their input, uh, all the participants for their uh, questions or at least attention over the last one hour and a half. And let me thank also in particular the AI staff, including uh, Francesca Paganucci and Lorenzo Valeria for, Valeri for setting up the webinar. Uh, have a nice evening or day and uh, all the best from Rome.